Lord, thank you so much for these great folks. And um, man, their willingness to change this community. Lord, churches aren't just supposed to be part of community. They're supposed to be architects of the community. And Lord, when we do it right, when we love right, that builds great community. <laughs> and that's what we want to do. We want to do it in our schools as we provide shoes for kids. We want to do it in the meals we provide for people that are going through a difficult time right now or whatever the case might be. So um, just I pray that you would shine your light and your love through all this. Now for the next few moments, Lord, let us really focus in with clear and open hearts about what you would have us to hear in your name. Amen. I want to kind of do some review today uh, if you're brand new and so you're not going to miss anything. And then I'm going to, just a warning, I'm going to push really, really hard today. Probably harder than I normally do. And um, I hope you'll give me some grace in that because I know when I finish today, most of y'all are going to drive down this hill and you're going to think, you know, I, I kind of, what Tom said makes sense. It makes sense for me in my life. It makes sense for me in my marriage, my family, whatever the case might be. But what you're going to struggle with is actually moving what makes sense to you into some kind of reality. So you're going to struggle from agreeing with me to actually doing something, from moving from agree to do. And so that's what we're going to wrestle with. You're going to come up with countless immediate reasons as to why you can't do what we're going to ask you to do today. And, and the reason I know this is because I have done the exact same thing. I mean, I'm like a professional excuse maker. I mean, I get paid for that. I mean, I can focus on, in my life, what is really urgent and neglect what is most important. Can anybody else relate to that? I can find myself doing that. And so, I'll, I'll, you know, a whole bunch of people have an agenda or desire or something they want me to do, and then I can neglect what is most important because I'm always doing these, these putting out these fires. Um, I can convince myself, as I think about the idea of getting involved in a Christian community, I can convince myself that all Christians are bad and that it's a pastor's heart. What can I say? You know, all Christians are bad and, and that, I, you know, I can't trust anybody. And I mean, I can go through, you know, if, if, if they really knew me, they wouldn't have anything to do with me. All that kind of stuff. Having said that, I'm actually praying that hundreds of people in the alive community will make the decision to move from agreeing to, to, to doing. And that's what I'm hoping to happen today. <clears throat> if you cut a live open and looked at what motivates us. You wouldn't see a desire for a church to be large. You wouldn't see a desire for a church to even make a difference in a community, although some of these things might be important. If you cut us open, what you're going to see is the desire for every person who is part of the alive community to experience some kind of spiritual transformation. That's the goal. That's what we brainstorm around. It's what we create worship experiences around. It's what our children's and student ministries, it's what we're all doing. We want to see spiritual transformation. And the reason is we don't believe that Jesus is just some kind of costume jewelry that we put on and put off when it's convenient. But we think a, a relationship with Jesus has, has, abs, has the possibility and the potential to change absolutely everything. I'm a little concerned about what we've made it, especially here in the South, if you'll allow me to say that. It's almost like we've made it part of our culture and we've forgotten what Jesus actually said it was. Paul, Paul described a relationship with Jesus this way. He said, if anyone's in Christ, he or she is a brand spanking new car smelling creation. So he didn't just put lipstick on a pig in my sense. He didn't just like say, oh, got a little Jesus on Tom, that looks better. That's not what happened. According to this, I'm brand new. So the old is gone and a whole bunch of new stuff is coming on. That's what Paul said this relationship with Jesus thing is all about. And Jesus didn't just come to share some vision of what to be a new creation to our, to our people and to, to our community. He, he actually gave us a strategy for how that spiritual transformation works best. And we've been learning this in this series. And the way we've said it in summary is this. We come into a room like this and we learn or hear truth in rows. That's what we do every Sunday, or most Sundays. We'll sit, in, and this is what happens, by the way, in the church across America. We come and we sit in a room in rows, and that's important. It's where we learn, learn truth in rows like this. But the place we actually grow, the place where you will actually begin to shape what we're learning is in circles. So we say it like this, you learn truth in rows, and we grow or we train in circles. 
Jesus spoke to crowds. That's throughout the pages of Scripture. People would hear the truth in rows, just like we're doing. That has value. That exposed people to truth. But when Jesus called his disciples to follow him, they immediately found themselves doing life with other people. You should check me on this. Read it for yourself in Scripture. Whatever you want to pick, just read what Jesus did because together they were all these disciples and they would sit at the feet of Jesus and what they did was they would listen to what Jesus said and then they'd try to live it and they'd talk about it amongst themselves. What do you think Jesus meant when he told this story? And they hung on every syllable of Jesus' mouth and it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to have two cups of coffee and a little bit of Jesus today. Whatever Jesus said, they were full force behind. Like, I want this in my life. I want to be part of this. And so they tried to figure out how to make it part of their lives. They weren't looking for loopholes. They weren't looking for easy layups. They weren't looking for ways to make this thing smoother or easier, fit their culture. They were absolutely absolutely wrecked by Jesus and wanted him to be the core of their identity. And that's so far different than what I see us trying to live out these days. A disciple isn't just someone who believes the right stuff about God. And that may be where some of us are in this room. We we say, Tom, you know, I went down, I shook some pastor's hand, or maybe I went to an altar, or whatever you did, I don't know. And you think, so I got that, and we, and we check these things off our list, you know. We think, well, I must be a Christian. I did these things. Let me tell you, you can be a great theologian and still not be a disciple of Jesus Christ. You can know all the right things about God and have all the Southern Christian answers and be totally lost. It's true. You can believe right, but still live wrong. And many of us have started following Jesus and we started calling ourselves Christians because we wanted less guilt or less shame and then wanted to make sure we were in heaven when we died and not hell. Or maybe we became Christians because we wanted to hopefully get over everything that happened in college. Whatever the situation, or maybe we all of a sudden found ourselves in a family, so well, now I need to start acting and smelling like a Christian. But being a disciple is moving from what God does for me, the things on my checklist, but being a disciple is moving from that and actually moving into God himself. Speaking to God himself, asking God himself to teach you. Being a disciple is stepping into this brand spanking new life that starts the moment you bump into Jesus and then you start trusting him with everything. So when Jesus came to the planet and he started doing his, own, his earthly ministry, he actually started with the, same, with the message that he used throughout his ministry. Um, and this is an example, this is after the whole baptism thing. This is from Matthew chapter 4. This is the beginning of Jesus's public ministry, and this is what he said. He said, uh, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. You can actually read this. I think it's also in, in Matthew 17. I'm not sure of the second one, but it, it's, it's like a parenthesis in the book of Matthew. But he said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, this just makes sense for me. I don't know how you grew up with repent, but I grew up with the word repent with a with a red-faced, sweating, yelling preacher asking me to repent. That may not be your experience. If not, that's great. <laughs> but it was mine, and so um, I thought he was saying repaint for a long time. And I think, well, that doesn't look too bad in here, really. But if they, I thought they must paint every week. You know, the guy's calling for paint every week. We just want shoes. I mean, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> repaint, repaint. Okay, so um, <clears throat> that won't be in the third service. So here, here's what Jesus came to the planet. Here's what he did. Jesus came and he taught this whole new kind of love. Now, you and I, we've grown up in this culture. We've grown up with this kind of love. But when Jesus came to the planet, it was brand new. He taught a whole new kind of love. What kind of love? An unconditional love. And this was in a culture that every love was conditioned. You do this, then you can be loved. Jesus spoke of a divine love that was poured out to humanity even when humanity could care less that, of a divine love. And this was totally different because at that point, every divine entity, you, you earned their love. But when Jesus came to the planet, he said, you don't even have to earn this love. He loves you even when you're just jacked up. He still loves you. And then Jesus taught you could be forgiven for your sin by asking. You didn't have to burn a goat or a pigeon or whatever. You didn't have to do any of that. You just, you just have to ask and you can be forgiven. Why? Because of divine love. Never heard that before. You and I, this is normal. Oh, yeah, ho-hum, I've heard this my whole life. 
Jesus taught, came to planet, he taught mercy. And mercy was this idea that we are given something we do not deserve. We're like given this pass at times and, and when we deserve something totally different. And then like the creme de la creme, the, the, the amazing part of it all was when he invented grace. And grace was this thing where he said, this is something you can't even earn. You can't get a wage and deserve this. You can't work hard enough. It's just unmerited thing that God pours out to you. So listen, just that brief list, when those kinds of truths hit our culture, of course we had to rethink everything. Because the culture had never seen those things before. So Jesus' word is rethink everything. Rethink how you think about everything. Why? Well, because of what I just said. Everything's different now. This is a different reality. And this is why you'll see Jesus often call us to repent, because he's introducing a whole new reality. And so this is what we mean by spiritual formation. It's actually this process of repenting, rethinking how you think about everything. So when I say alive is committed to spiritual formation, this is what I mean. We're identifying untrue ideas, untrue ideas, thoughts, and definitions about God, yourself, and the world. And we're replacing them with the ideas, thoughts, and definitions that filled the mind of Christ. That's what we mean by spiritual formation. That's what we long to see happen in you, your children, your marriage, your teens, everyone. That's what we long to see happen. So being a disciple of Jesus doesn't, it doesn't guarantee this conflict-free life. It doesn't guarantee this illness-free life or that everybody will love us all the time or we'll have lots of friends and chocolate doesn't have any calories. It doesn't include any of that. But what Jesus does offer is he said, if you will do this, I can give you this abundant, full life. Jesus boldly proclaimed, this is the kind of life you and I, what we were made for. Sitting at the feet of the rabbi as his disciple. And this is possible for absolutely everybody. And the reason I know that is I lived a long time of my life thinking that that was good for everybody else but me. But as I read the thing, and you can read it yourself, but you don't have to earn any merit badges you don't have to jump through any hoops. You don't have to have a spotless past, present, or maybe spotless future. But spiritual formation starts the moment you step toward Jesus and the moment you decide to sit at the feet of Jesus as his disciple. So I had this conviction in my life, and I've hesitated to share it with you because I don't know what it's rooted in. So maybe you can psychoanalyze what's going on with me. But it could be, could be that my childhood was one where I felt out of control. I don't know. It could be that I'm a Sagittarius. I have no idea what, what any of this means. But it could be that I have a deep drive. I don't even know why I know I'm a Sagittarius, but I do know that I am. So I could be that I have a deep, I think I am. I'm not really sure now I think about it. But anyway, I could be that I have a deep drive to understand things. I, I like to understand. I like to discover purpose and meaning and have clarity on those kinds of things. So I don't really don't know. But here's, here's my conviction. I want to build a life that stands up. I do. I want to build a life that stands up. Well, what do I mean? I want to have a strong life, a strong belief system. I want to have strong relationships. And the last thing I want to do is lay up in some area of my life. I don't want to punt anything because I know that life will punch me in the mouth. I understand that. I, and it has, and I, you know, I, I know, I, like you, I know relationships are tough. I know my beliefs are going to be challenged. I've been through this stage in my life where my convictions are confronted by crisis, and I realized, huh, I don't really believe that. But these things that come, do come my way, when I do get hit in the mouth, when I do get kicked in the areas, when all these things kind of happen, I, I want to stand I just want to stand. And it goes beyond that. Just, I want to teach my kids to stand. Because I know what they're facing every day when they run off to schools or when they run out in the world and all these kinds of things. I, I know it. I know what they're facing online, right? I want to teach them. I want my marriage to stand. I want my friends that I'm doing life with, the people that I have influence on, 
the people that, I, that come around and, and are in my home, I want all of us to stand. Uh, it's a little bit what Matthew 7 talks about, building a life on rock versus sand. I want to build a life on a rock, and so I don't want to settle halfway. So Lisa and I call it the bring it life. <laughs> I think you should get t-shirts. Because, <laughs> you know, the Me Too movement st- stole our Me Too idea, which was our idea first, but they copied it. But I think maybe we should just do bring it t-shirts. <laughs> And building a life that stands, a life that stands can handle breakups and crackups and betrayals and lies and health and disease and fear and failure. It stands. A life that stands can handle whatever life throws at it, all the storms, all the butt whoopings, all the defeats, and yet it can still stand. That's the kind of life I want to build. But here's the discovery that is so paradoxical in my mind. Building a life that stands begins by sitting at the feet of Jesus. It does. And so I find myself daily, sometimes more than once daily, parking myself at the feet of Jesus and reading what Jesus says, trying to hear what Jesus is saying to me because I want this life to stand. And I want to do everything that I have, every ounce of my being, to help others build a life that stands. And so that's a big part of what motivates me these days. Being a disciple of Jesus is more than a belief system. It's more than a fish on a car. It's a strategic positioning and passion to sit at the feet of Jesus and doing less talking and more listening and learning to surrender as opposed to resist. And sitting at the feet of Jesus is where spiritual transformation happens. And spiritual transformation happens best, not in these rows. It's like I'm talking myself out of my job, right? But it actually happens best in circles. And Alive didn't come up with this. This isn't like we read a book or we invented this. When we went to Scripture and we sat at the feet of Jesus and said, what's the best way for people to experience spiritual transformation? I mean, if you're going to invest here, your time, your family, your energies... What should I say to you? And the scripture was resoundingly clear when we started to look back at the best environments for spiritual transformation to take place. It happened in the earliest days of the church and the method or strategy was used by those people who sat at the feet of Jesus. So the book of Acts, um, it follows the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's four guys who basically shared, wrote books about their experience with Jesus. And then comes the book of Acts, and Acts is like short for actions, and it describes the actions of the disciples, and particularly Peter and Paul are described in that particular book. In Acts chapter 2, Peter, who Jesus invited to leave everything as a fisherman and to come and follow him, he stands before this hostile crowd, and Peter unloads on those people. I mean... (laughs) He, he didn't pull any punches, if you will. He lets this Jewish crowd know, hey, y'all remember the Messiah idea? Do you remember like the Messiah that, that was promised to us from 2,000 years ago? Yeah, y'all just killed him. And, and, and that, that's not good, you know. And so the people were like, oh, my gracious, what do we do? And, you know, which I would have said, y'all better run for the hills. Lightning's getting ready to hit all y'all. And they would have went, you know, and then was, I just kidding, come back, come back. But, but thankfully it wasn't me that was giving it. But that was Peter, and he was speaking. He says to them, he says, hey, listen, y'all just killed the Messiah. And they said, and they said, they, what should we do? You know what Peter said? Repent. Rethink how you think about everything. You rethink a world where the Messiah has come. And that day, over 3,000 men, that culture didn't count the women and children. It's just part of their culture. So somewhere around 10,000 people, they figure, that day began to follow Jesus. And the movement of the Christian church began. Over 3,000 men, 10,000 women, children believed and were baptized that day. Here's the thing. (laughs) They did not have it all together. We have so systematized this thing, I almost wonder if we're squelching a movement. Over 3,000 believed that day and then were baptized that day. They didn't have any fancy clothes or fancy t-shirts. They came in what they had. And they were dunked that day. They didn't have, they weren't tithers. They didn't understand the deep mysteries of the Trinity. 
They hadn't cleared out their fridges or their private stashes or cleansed their internet history yet. They didn't have sound theology. In fact, they probably didn't even know what the Holy Spirit was, but they wanted to be identified with the rabbi, and they were baptized. And then watch what happens. Next verse, as the movement is birthed, they, that's the people that were just baptized, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayer. I looked that word devoted up because I want to build a life that stands. It's actually a Greek compound word. Check this out. I don't know if this is just appeals to guys or not, but you guys, this really meant something to me. It means a forceful movement towards. Yeah, you all did exactly what the early service did, which was primarily nothing. So what I did is I added a little cheer to it. It's like a forceful movement towards. You see what I'm saying? Did you feel that? That time felt a little stronger, right? I'm going to do that in the third service. But that's kind of what it is. It's this forceful movement towards. In other words, it's not like, oh, hum, I guess I'll be devoted to that. Uh, pass me the chicken. It's not that at all. This is a person who says, I am so into this. I will prioritize everything. It's a commitment to stand. Next verse. They devoted themselves, forceful movement towards. Next verse. They broke bread in their homes and ate to together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and joined the favor of all the people. And then daily more people were added to the number. This is the New Testament church, which is what we are a part of. This is the church empowered by the Holy Spirit. This is the major challenge from the pages of Scripture for those of us who say we are disciples, who say we follow Jesus. This is what they say. Rearrange your entire stinking life by devoting yourself to someone new. That's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And it changes the way you do marriage. It changes the way you do single. It changes sexuality. It changes how you parent. It changes how you grandparent. It changes how you do your occupation. It changes how you do your vocation. It changes how you do your money. Everything. Because you're rearranging your life by devoting yourself, forcefully moving towards something that is new. This is such a strong challenge. Do you know how hard it is to change your pattern of behavior? Anybody else tried dieting? If you haven't, nobody likes you. Just kidding. Man, it's hard to change behavior. Imagine trying to change some kind of loyalty in your life. Because this is exactly what the scripture calls us to. How in the world are we to be convinced to change some kind of loyalty in our lives sitting in a row like this? Apostle Paul, he, he was called Saul when he was hunting Christians. He was called Paul later. I have no idea why, but it must have been very difficult for the whole monogramming thing. But... He started out as a Saul, and it's dead gum, and now I got to do a P, you know, whatever that is. I just, Saul, Paul, it's just one letter. Couldn't you just kept it? But anyway, um, I digress. <laughs> so um, he, he was what I would call a theist. And what I mean by that is he was a deeply devoted follower of God. God. He just didn't buy the whole Jesus stuff. But he was a deeply devoted follower of God. In fact, he was so devoted to following God, forcefully moving toward, that he, would, he thought people that followed Jesus were, were the enemy. And so Saul Paul was like hunted Christians. He had like a, a license, and he would kill Christians. That's kind of what he did. And, and he is on his way to uh, this place called Damascus, and his purpose for going there is to hunt Christians, literally to kill them. And he encounters this great light from heaven. And this, this, this passage has been just messing with me. Watch, watch what happens. Acts 9, 4. Saul Paul fell to the ground, and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, just a pause. Scripture doesn't have the ability to do bold or highlight. 
So when they wanted something to really stand out, they'd repeat it. So what, what, what Saul is saying is when he heard that voice, it was like this major voice, like, like almost like a shout. Saul, and the voice says, why do you persecute me? Now this is a curious question. And the reason it's curious is because Paul has never seen Jesus before. He wouldn't know him if he walked into a room. He's never seen him. He's never saw a picture of him like we did growing up, you know, standing outside that weird, creepy door. He's never even seen a picture like that. And yet the voice from heaven says, why are you persecuting me? And Saul says to him, Basically, well, who the heck are you? I've never even heard of you before. I've never heard a voice from heaven, certainly. So who are you? Now, this is amazing. Why are you persecuting me? And Saul says, I don't even know who you are. And here comes this response that is so pregnant with meaning for our current day and culture. Saul has no idea who's even talking to him because he's never talked with God. He's never seen Jesus, never shared a meal with Jesus. Saul's whooping up on Christians, and the light says, why are you persecuting me? And Saul asks, who are you? And this is what Jesus says. He says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. This is massive. Because this is a challenge to how you see church, how I see church. This pushes on any take it or leave it concept. This pushes on any idea that church is what I do on Sunday and the rest is up to me. This, this pushes on any of that. In this passage, the person of Jesus Christ and the body of believers is identified as a single identity. Read it for yourself. Saul is whooping up on the body. And the voice says, from heaven says, why are you whooping up on me? And in this moment of revelation, Saul, who now becomes Paul, gives his life to Jesus. And this is amazing and wonderful. The connection between people who follow Jesus and the person of Jesus is transformational. Let me be very clear and make it very uncomfortable. What we've just read is when you hurt the body, you're hurting Jesus himself. Doesn't that just rock you? When I talk about you as a fellow brother or sister, I'm actually talking about him. When I kick you in the shin and you retaliate back, that's not Christian, but when I kick you in the shin, I'm kicking Jesus in the shin, according to what we've just read. Immediately after this experience, Paul gets his first lesson on the implications of what he's just discovered. Instead of having this burning bush moment where the bush says something like to Moses, like, go forth and let my people go. Instead of that moment, Paul is instructed to be led to Damascus. Why is he led? Because all of a sudden, Paul finds himself blind. You have been persecuting the body. And now Jesus is going to teach you to be dependent on the body. So Jesus has Saul struck blind, and now he has to be led to Damascus. You know where he's taken to? <laughs> A small group. No kidding. Read it for yourself. And, and, and the small group... They didn't want him there either. You know how you all have some people come to your small group, say, I hope they don't show up? <laughs> <You know. laughs> and if you've never had that experience, it's probably you. But anyway, um, <laughs> I hope I do better the third time. This is not good. Um, but the small group leader said, man, we don't want him here. We, he's got a reputation. We don't want him here. And so in other words, that's part of it. And they had to work that out with God himself too. And so he's actually led into that very community that he was going to kill. And that Christian communities told him what to do. Now, I haven't fully unpacked this in my own life, but as disciples, we seek guidance through Jesus. 
However, since Jesus refers both to the historical Jesus, who's now exalted to be with the, heavens and the Heavenly Father, one day he comes back, and the concrete historical body of believers here on earth, when we seek guidance in terms of discernment and decisions, we need to look not just to God in heaven, but also to what is being pointed out to us by the body of Christ here on earth. Namely, our families and our friends, the people we're sitting at the feet of Jesus alongside. Let me even make this more uncomfortable. What this means is, I can no longer say, well, I've been with Jesus, and Jesus told me this is okay, if my small group says it's not. Don't you hate that? In an age where Jesus is customized, and following Jesus is customized, according to what we've just learned, Jesus will actually use you to speak into my life what he wants to be said. Isn't that something? Now, are there times that gets messed up? Of course. Yes. But apparently you have tremendous value in my walk with God as the body of Christ. There was a time in my life when I was absolutely wrecked. Shame, guilt, some of it was real and deserved, some of it wasn't. And this, this so permeated who I was as a single adult, and then I even carried it into my marriage to lease for the first couple of years. And I deeply committed myself to doing exactly what you're doing now. I was at service every time a door was opened. I tried a mess of different churches. I would just go and sit in a row. I would discipline myself. Pray, read my Bible, pray, read my Bible, sit in row. Pray, read my Bible, sit in rows. And it wasn't until I began to devote myself to a group of guys who held me accountable and surrounded me with a different kind of love that I was finally able to get free from a lot of the junk I was carrying. I'll never forget the, the time when I told this group my shame producers, my guilt. To be honest with you, <laughs> I felt like I was sort of passing out bullets. And I was, because I didn't trust Christians, I didn't even like them. Because they'd hurt me. And so I felt like I was saying, here's some things I've messed up in my life. And so I got done sharing, and I just sort of braced myself, thinking, man, here we go. They're just going to unload. But instead of shooting me with the bullets, these brothers spoke truth into my life for the first time. It wasn't some dude up here and I was sitting in a row. But they looked me eyeball to eyeball and said, hey, let's speak some truth in your life. Number one, you're not alone. You think you're the most creative sinner on the planet? Your sins are pretty boring compared to mine. And number two, I fully know you and I can fully love you. And I can talk about Jesus loving me. But until I felt my brothers embrace me in that moment, I never understood what full love was about. But when those brothers embraced me and got around me and said, Tom, you're right. You are one jacked up dude. But man, we love you. With the love of Jesus, that changed everything. See, the God of the incarnation has real flesh on earth and speaks to us in the bread and butter of our lives through things that have skin circumstances and families and neighbors and churches and the people who are willing to commit to sit at the feet of Jesus with us in a circle. Let's say you have a conviction that you want to learn how to swim. Maybe you need to get over a fear or maybe you just need to feel empowered by learning to swim. Maybe you need to be close to a pool. I don't know. But the idea of a boat turning over and you not knowing how to swim, it's simply unacceptable. So you want to learn how to swim. And maybe you've even gone so far as to think about someone you love turning over in a boat and not knowing how to swim. So you really want to learn how to swim. But the problem is we're all devoted to other things already. 
We have money to make, memories to build, bodies to exercise, ladders to climb, and seasons to finish. So even though we know we need to learn how to swim, we never get around to it. But the irony is, as we live in our devotions, we are constantly surrounded by people we love who are already drowning, and we still don't have time to learn how to swim. Small groups don't just teach us what we ought to do. This is where we train as disciples, devote ourselves to a life that will stand. And if you don't train, let me tell you what will happen because this has happened for me. What will happen is you will sit in a row week after week and then life will come and knock you off your feet. And if you're wired like me, you're immediately going to get mad about that. And you're going to get mad at God, you're going to get mad at her, you're going to get mad at him, you're going to get mad at the disease, mad at finances, whatever. And the reason we're going to get mad is because we were not ready for what hit us. But training in a circle with other disciples at the feet of Jesus is where the devotion is developed that prepares us for the abundant life. So please, you think about it. You consider it. Some of you may be ready to walk out those doors and talk to the small group leaders. Look for a normal one and go there. If you're into the weird ones, go to one of the weird looking ones and go there. I mean, it's fine. Whatever you want. I mean, nothing, nothing perfect out there. It's just people doing life. Or maybe you're not ready, but maybe you can go online. Maybe you say, Tom, uh, the idea of me being in someone's group is not appealing. Uh, so great. Lead your own group. That'd be fantastic. Just get your friends and lead. And what does that mean? Well, we're doing our best to create as many resources as possible to give you. In fact, uh, they've just finished the first editing of the video I mentioned last week. It's a video series that will be online that I did this summer. And you will watch that video, which is 8 to 10 minutes of brilliant teaching. And then, um, and then, then you guys will have the questions that you can correct everything that I messed up. <laughs> and, and that's kind of what it is. And you can do that right in your own home. Right in your own home. Or you can do it at a coffee shop. You can do whatever you want. Just let us know how we can best stand alongside. But the heart cry is build, life, build a life that will stand. And, and I'll build a life that stands. And together we'll, we'll link arms. And we'll start forming a community that will stand. Huh? Jesus... Thank you for these beautiful people. <laughs> Part of the difficulty, Lord, in having this discussion with this room of people is they're all so incredible. I mean, it'd be different if we weren't doing anything with our lives, <laughs> but we're all busy people. Some of us are major leaders in the communities, coaching our teams trying to build the best families we can build, make the most income we can make. And Lord, it's hard to ask them to step away from something that's amazing to make time to build a life that stands. But Lord, I'm 30 years into this now, and I've seen it. I've seen people that have the world by the tail get bit by the very thing they thought they were holding on to. And Lord, we want to be a community of people that stand, not perfect, not, not strong in our own power. But I can stand because of who my life is surrounded by, who I'm sitting at the feet of Jesus with. So I pray that you, Lord, would now do the work. And Lord, my burden, especially today, is for the men in this room. I don't know why. But that they would have the courage to lead their families they would have the courage to say over lunch, I think we better do something with this. <laughs> Pass the chicken. <laughs> and they would lead families that stand. So speak to our hearts. Mark them now by the power of your Holy Spirit in your name.